We all know what happened to Peter Parker, but what would really happen to you if you were bitten by a radioactive spider? Let's get technical. The origin of Spider-Man starts all the way back in 1962 in the panels of Amazing Fantasy 15. And in those panels, scientists are demonstrating to Peter Parker and his class their amazing control over so-called radioactive rays. The scientists throw the switch on their machine, but at the exact same time, an unfortunate spider dangles down from the ceiling and absorbs a fantastic amount of radiation. The spider, then totally stressed out and in its death throes, then bites Peter, who then more or less immediately gains superpowers. The origin story of Spider-Man has changed over the years, but what would happen to you if you were in this same original situation? First, those 50-year-old panels got something exactly right. Spiders do not want to bite us. Whether it's our evolution or our culture, we have a habit of blaming spiders. We think that they bite us all the time. Any unexplained bump or rash has to be a spider's fault, we just assume. But from spider statistics and behavior, we can say definitively, it's almost never a spider bite, no matter what you think it is. For example, it's always fun to joke that everything, including spiders in Australia, want to kill you, right? <laughs> oh, good I got bit by a spider. But just guess how many people have died from spider bites like that from the very venomous funnel web spider in the last, uh, let's make it interesting, 40 years. Just guess for a second. I can tell you, it's one. Contrast this tiny number with the number of people in the US alone each year that are bitten by dogs, and suddenly spiders don't seem quite as nasty. Come here. Come here, you little spider. Come here. Hey, Get over here. Come here, you little spider. Hey. This isn't to say that spiders don't bite people. They definitely do. It's just that we seem to think because of our spider bias that spider bites are much more common and much more dangerous than they actually are. For example, most people are afraid of the brown recluse and black widow. No, the, the more alive black widow. There we go. However, mostly thanks to the development of anti-venom, there have been almost zero deaths combined between these two spiders in the last few decades. In the United States, there hasn't been a death by Black Widow since 1983 if you don't include Endgame. Not only are potentially dangerous spiders rarely deadly, we are terrible at identifying spider bites in the first place. For example, in a recent study in Southern California, which does have black widow spiders, out of 200 people who came in saying they definitely got bit by a spider, less than 4% of them actually got bit by a spider. And this is consistent across the literature. The vast majority of the time, we mistakenly blame spiders. It's hard to even get statistics like this because of misreporting and mis remembering our inherent spider bias. It's fine. It's really fine. They're, they're mostly fine. There you go. Adding to all of this, yes, most spiders are venomous, but almost none of them can physically bite into us even if they wanted to. We have identified around 40,000 species of spider worldwide. Out of all of these species, how many of them do you think can both bite us and have venom that is dangerous to us? Well, maybe you can sense a theme here, but it's literally like 12. 12 spider bites. The fact is, most spiders on Earth do not have venom that is dangerous to us, and most spiders on Earth do not have the chelicerae, or pointy fangy mouth bits, that are capable to deliver that venom into our bodies. The daddy long legs is probably the biggest victim of this kind of misconception. They aren't venomous in the way they would harm us, they do not have fangs that are big enough to make it into our skin, and they're not even spiders. And yet we treat them like they're secretly super deadly? We need Need to get over our spider bias. Now go, go hang on the bedroom ceilings and wait to jump on their faces when they're sleeping. It's fine. They're not even spiders. Spider-Man's comic origins got it right. Spiders really do only bite us in extreme situations. So let's just say that against all odds, a radioactive spider does bite you. What happens next? In the original comic panels, the infamous spider becomes radioactive when it accidentally finds itself in the firing line of radioactive rays. 
Studies do show that insects and arachnids can handle a lot more radiation than you or I could before dying, somewhere between 30 and 1500 grays, which is an increase of 10 to 500 times over what we can handle. So maybe a spider could absorb a fantastic amount of radiation. The question no one ever asks of this scenario though is, how does this spider actually become radioactive? Now, I know the scientists in the original comics said radioactive rays, but what if that was just fancy 60s comic speak for a beam of neutrons? And I suggest this because neutron bombardment is the only common way for otherwise normal stuff to become radioactive stuff. It's called neutron activation. Very basically, neutron activation is the act of shoving neutrons into an otherwise stable atomic nucleus. This makes the nucleus bigger and unstable. It wants to return to stability. So in order to do so, it throws off particles and radiation to get back down to its unexcited state. It's kind of like that guy that you drive behind on the highway who tried to stuff too much stuff in his trunk and didn't secure all of it properly instead of just taking like two seconds to secure all of it. Now he's putting your life in danger because parts of it are falling down onto the highway and maybe breaking your windshield. You don't want to stop and pull over and call AAA and you're late for the dentist already. Sorry. All normal material can be neutron activated, even spider material. You can, in theory, make a spider radioactive through neutron activation. However, it's not exposure to the spider itself that changes Peter's nerd bod. It is exposure to the spider's venom. And so the maximum dose of radiation you could receive, or Peter, depends on exactly how much venom a spider can inject into you. Take the Black Widow again. It has dangerous venom, but not very much of it. The average bite from a Black Widow only imparts two hundredths of a single milligram worth of venom into its victim, just a few sand grains worth of mass. So now let's get technical. Let's say our spider has a Black Widow's amount of venom and after it is irradiated, that venom is somehow, through maybe neutron activation, as radioactive as something like uh, uh, plutonium. This is ridiculous as an assumption, but let's say it happens anyway, because this amount is so small, it has to be really radioactive or else nothing's gonna happen. Now the spider bites you and you have 20 micrograms of radioactive venom coursing through your bloodstream, emitting alpha particles that is smashing into cellular structures inside of your cells and punching holes in your DNA. If the venom stayed in your bloodstream, after a week you would have absorbed the same full body dose that you'd want to absorb over 20 years in just one week. And after a month, you would start to notice some changes in your blood cell count because now you have non-fatal but still totally really bad radiation sickness, yay. The reality is, if a truly radioactive spider bit you, it either wouldn't be radioactive enough to do anything to your body, or it would be so radioactive that just a tiny amount of its venom would start taking a bone saw to your DNA. Oh yeah. And broken DNA doesn't give you superpowers, it gives you cancer. This is why later interpretations of Spider-Man's origin story leaned into a genetically engineered spider with genetically engineering venom. And I know I may have just knocked your hopes and dreams of being Spider-Man off of a tall bridge and you tried to save it with a web, but you couldn't. So maybe let's take this question in a different direction. What if you were bitten by the most radioactive spider in the world? If a radioactive spider had the most radioactive venom, it would become literally the most toxic animal on Earth. When we say something is radioactive, like this ominous hunk of metal here, what do we actually mean? Well, you've probably heard of half-life, right? It's the amount of time it takes for half of a radioactive material to <coughs> decay away. And if we know this amount of time and how many atoms are in this hunk of metal, we can calculate how many of those nuclear decay events happen every second. And the more that happen per second, the more radioactive something is. Makes sense. For example, let's say that this hunk of metal is actually radium-226, an isotope of radium. It would make this metal one of the most radioactive substances on Earth. If we had a kilogram of radium-226 right here, it would be throwing out 36 trillion particles every single second. And because these particles carry ionizing energy, it is very dangerous to stand right next to it. But it's not the most dangerous. 
This is just a few milligrams of polonium-210. It was discovered and named after Poland in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie. It was the first element to be discovered by its extreme radioactivity alone. Here I have just a few milligrams of it, just a snowflake's worth of mass, and it still literally glows blue in air because the particles it's throwing off as it decays are ionizing the air around it. Polonium-210 isn't the most radioactive substance that we know of, but it might be one of the scariest because the particles it's throwing off carry very high energies. Those particles don't travel very far in air though, so you could stand about this far away from it and you'd be fine. But if this got into your body, you'd now be in contact with one of the most toxic substances on Earth. So let's put it in our spider's venom. The most radioactive spider on Earth is about to bite us during our field trip and inject us with a Black Widow's worth of polonium-210 in liquid form. Wait, for math first, you know that. Spider math. We know the radioactivity of polonium-210. We know how much mass is gonna be in your bloodstream from the bite, and we know how much energy each one of those decaying particles will have and impart to your body. We are gonna consider what this does to you over the course of a day if you have Spider-Man's mass. If you were bit by the most radioactive spider, after just a day, you would absorb an entire body dose of three grays. You would feel nauseous, confused, you would start throwing up, and, and then you, and you would lose all your hair. A week after being bitten by this spider, you would have absorbed a total of 23 grays. You're going into shock, you're in and out of consciousness, your organs are failing. For context, the 100% lethal dose, even with medical treatment, starts at eight grays. You are not waking up with nerd abs after this. If our spider's venom was as radioactive as polonium-210, the amount of venom it would need to inject into you to do something to your body in the form of definitely killing you would be just a single microgram, less than a third the mass of a single grain of sand. Polonium-210 is so radioactive that it doesn't really have any uses outside of just being radioactive as a source of radiation for heating up space probes in space with radioactivity and being used as a is a very potent poison. I, I guess though it would put the venom in venom. <laughs> So, what would really happen to you if you were bitten by a radioactive spider? Well, the comics got a lot right. You can, in theory, make a spider radioactive. Spiders only bite people in extreme situations, and if a radioactive spider bit you, it could, in theory, do something to your body. However, that something could either be almost nothing or so much that instead of wall climbing powers and shooting webs out and stuff, you have the powers of nausea and organ failure? Honestly, the most unbelievable part of Spider-Man's origin story isn't that radioactivity did something to Peter Parker, it's that a spider jumped to his hand and bit him in the first place. Because science. To me, my spiders! All of you! Yes, to their basements we go to lie and wait in the dark. Neutron activation can be a serious uh, concern, especially if you're working around things that uh, emit radiation and emit neutrons. It can make things like your workspace radioactive. I actually got this sticker, which says, uh, caution, radioactive material potentially activated. I got this at a national laser lab because what they do there can actually emit neutrons into the surrounding environment and activate material. So they build most of the lab out of concrete and not steel because steel can become activated by these neutrons and then it can become radioactive and therefore a workplace hazard. And I have it on this mug because it's probably not radioactive. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, Dakota. If you want more of me and Because Science, you can follow us on these social media handles here, and hey, you can suggest ideas for future episodes. Sometimes I use them, but often I do not. And if you want to check out any of our other series that we're doing, like the Science and Mortal Kombat or Because Space, please go back to the Because Science channel and check those out too.